September 28, 2016 Sustainability Board regular meeting. My name is Nick Sanzone. I live at 200 Villa Del Mar, Satellite Beach, Florida. Tonight I'm going to be proposing the Shoreline Stewards Initiative. I got one for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So basically, this idea stems off of the conversation I had with you guys previously about two months ago regarding the property off of DeSoto that used to be Peg Legs. Uh, a temporary usage for that property is something that you seemed interested in, so this kind of coincides with that. The idea is to educate the grade school uh, students and kids by giving them the opportunity to have an educational teaching garden that they can use. Uh, to better understand their environment. So these educational teaching gardens, the goal is to have one of them in every school in Brevard County, in 82 schools. If every school had one, we could grow three million mangroves in one year. Uh, with the Brevard County Sales Tax Initiative coming up, uh, hopefully it will pass. And when it does pass, we would need mangroves to restore 20 miles of shoreline, according to the model that's presented by the county. So in order to restore that 20 miles of shoreline, we'll need enough vegetation to meet that mandate. Uh, currently, at all the different greeneries, grow houses, and nurseries locally, we don't have that type of uh, mass number of mangroves or the diversity of those mangroves. So to be ready for that, we would need to start growing mangroves last year because of the time it takes to grow mangroves to size to use them in restoration projects. So this kind of is a proactive approach to that that can use as an educational teaching tool. The cost of the shade house costs roughly $3,000. If you would like to be the first to build one at that location off of DeSoto, I would volunteer to help manage it. And I would uh, grow mangroves there and start workshops there and do those kinds of things as a uh, service to the city. It also coincides with a business plan that I'm coming up with to revegetate along the canals inside the seawalls. And I would like the city's support uh, for this initiative, if possible. And, uh, and then hopefully when the business portion of this comes around, we can actually talk about the city uh, being a supporter of this mangrove basket, this hanging mangrove basket that will hang off of a seawall and grow and create a barrier for wave energy to protect seawalls, to create habitat, to filter nutrients, and to educate the, the uh, citizenry of Satellite Beach. Uh, open it up to questions. If you guys have any questions regarding the Shade House, which is stage one, and then the business, which would be stage two. Uh, the Shade House would also include a solar panel uh, powered pump. Where would you get, are you primarily talking about reds? Uh, reds, blacks, and whites. Diverse is very important. Collecting them from uh, lands that the DEP approves, where we can collect them from with uh, partners like the Ferry Island Center, like Nicole Perna partners that actually own large tracts of land that have agreements to collect mangroves that would otherwise die, also from leading walks across the street from the property, where we can collect them off the beach where they would die as well. Because anything that washes up in the uh, zone on the beach is going to die, and then anything that washes up in areas where there's a lot of seawalls where they actually can't take root, they'll die there as well. And the DEP says that we can collect from those areas where the mangroves would die. And I collected Hundreds, if not thousands, of reds off of Sampson's Island. Yeah. Sure. Have a good year. It's loaded. Absolutely. We could incorporate Sampson's Island into the plan as well. 
Well, I don't think, uh, I mean, I'm just kind of guessing here, but I would be surprised to learn that anybody on this board would have any objection to that type of project or anything. Uh, I mean, probably, you know, most everybody would be, would be into it. Uh, but I think really that I, I don't think uh, I don't think this board will really have the authority to say yes or no on anything. I think you have to present that to the city council. Am I am I right about that, Courtney? Um, wh where are we doing this? I'm sorry, I had to run okay. out to tell the cheerleaders. The old peg legs, <laughs> peg legs. The DeSoto oh. property. Um, yeah, that property is up in the air right now because we're we're trying. We have um, in the city. Um, for operations, we are doing a number of projects that need to coincide and come together before we all take that to council for them to decide on what to do with that property. Um, because I think at this point right now we're, we're reserving it um, and any decisions on it because we, we, do, we, we might need it for a city facility at some point. Um, so. I don't know if they're willing. We'd be. I don't know if they'd be willing to spend money on something that we might be tearing out five years later. Mm -hmm. Would I say that if I could say that it would make its money back in that five years to pay for itself? Why don't we get together and talk about it? Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And then I would like to close with saying that also uh, I have a kayak launch, a kayak rack that was built by the Scouts recently that is not allowed to be. Uh, used at its current location. Uh, the town of Jupiter Island in Martin County doesn't want it. I'm going to go pick it up tomorrow, and if you guys want it, I'd like to give it to Satellite Beach. I spoke to the scouts that built it and the scout leader, and they're okay with that because they're from the area. And if you guys would like to use it in your future projects, I'd be happy to donate it to the city. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. We got another uh, public comment coming from the mayor back there. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nick. Thank you very much. Introduce yourself, please. I will, Frank Aquino, mayor. I sit on the Indian, the National Estuary Program, Indian River Council um, Advisory, Citizens Advisory Committee. I'm the chair of it now. There is a grant program that they want to give many grants away at $5,000 a pop. No one's applied yet, it's brand new, but this might be something right up your alley for something like that. So that money is going to be available. Courtney, I know I've asked this before, but what about that property across the street from Elwood? I know it's right on the beach, but do we have any plans for that? Would this be something that could potentially work there? Nothing's being done with it. and I mean, it has a good amount of space. and. I know I live across the street from there, so I don't really want anything to be done with it anyway. It'd be really nice to see some stuff grown and not a parking lot or a bathroom or anything like that. I think we were, we were just planning on doing pedestrian improvements there with the beach access. So um, a lot of the residents back there wanted to keep it the way it is. So um, there would be no parking or anything, but they did ask for restroom facilities there. Um, but you saw all that, which is pretty small. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, um, the so other location might be where we're going to be doing the um, community garden that we could kind of have a sister uh, location yeah. or a, an area near there because we're not going to use the whole space and so and he might just use it for five years or or something like that I love his idea I love his enthusiasm <laughs> and he should be we should do something like this because it is actually a great idea I guess I do have another question <clears throat> I was propagating reds, and the problem I found was getting them established in the river. And what is, you mentioned something about baskets or something, because uh, I tried them out and get them tall enough so they were over wave action, but that didn't work, and the pipes doesn't work very well, and so. So I have a patent pending for a product that I'm creating, <laughs> and the idea behind it is to attach it temporarily to the seawall with a bracket and a weighting mechanism, which can be anything from a small gardening donut to an actual uh, reef ball that you can create to whatever shape you want to create it to, to mimic the reef system. The idea is to grow the mangrove to at least three to four feet before putting it in the water. This way it has established prop roots and while it's hanging there for the next two to three years of its life it'll actually root into the soil and then you can take the bracket off and you'll leave behind a vegetated seawall which will reduce the impact of wave energy. So it's all about time and patience when it comes to uh, mangroves. 
So I hope you, that helps. <laughs> so could we see about maybe uh, inviting Nick to uh, be on the community garden committee? Sure. I would be honored. Thank you, Jeff. It is done. Yeah. Are you done with that committee? Well, yes. I mean, we just we came up with some ideas, but we have to actually do all the work. The if, you have, if you have space that's not already applied, you know, accounted for and everything like that, I mean, probably yeah. work that into those plans somehow. And, and I was at the meeting for the, the gardens, and I could help with the logistics of the rain barrels and how the water needs to flow and the timing and the pumping yeah, systems and things like that. I would be honored. Thank you. What, what would you need in the shade house? Just water? Or? So the shade house will run off of solar, and it'll have a pumping system that's attached to rain barrels that's going to run into uh, four by four posts that are sunk in the ground, shade cloth that's stretched over it, mm -hmm. and you're going to have PVC piping to carry the water. You'll have uh, cinder blocks on a pyramid on the walls to house your baby propagules, and you'll have two channels down the middle, one to walk down and one to have your bigger mangroves. I have a sketch that I can send you guys. How many square feet is it? Uh, it's 645, I think, 25 by 25 is something like that. Yeah, we should be able to cover that down. Yeah. There's plenty of them over there. Right. The other thing is, instead of rain barrels, or in addition to, if you do it down there at the uh, sports park, uh, the uh, DeSoto Park, there's an irrigation, uh, a uh, drainage ditch that's probably two or 300 feet. We could pump water from that. So you could just pump water out of there, and that's already, you know, a little bit brackish, so you're, you're Keep them them right. right, that's a good idea. And we could actually filter the water through the mangroves as they grow. And if, if you wanted to use the water in your gardens or, or maybe just for irrigation. So maybe we make this an agenda item. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, further public comment on non agenda items? I appreciate the opportunity to take 30 seconds and introduce you to an organization called the Citizens Climate Lobby. Will you please introduce yourself first? Please? My name is John Satoff, and I'm the group leader for this for the local chapter of this organization, okay. which consists of thousands of, of uh, volunteers across the country from all walks of life that are urging action on uh, dealing with climate change. So I'm not going to ask you for anything, but I, would, I want to introduce you to a film that we are sponsoring on August, on the uh, 21st of October. It'll be shown at the Lagoon House. Doors open at 6 p.m. And this is the first in a documentary series of films that is going to be sharing the stories of the communities that are on the leading edge of climate change. And this one in particular is the story of Norfolk, Virginia, um, which has been hammered pretty hard. And it's not only the city that's under threat, it's, it's the naval installation, which is the base for a good percentage of the U.S. naval fleet. And so the Navy is concerned as well. Uh, so this will be moving around the country. The tour of the film is uh, on the east coast of the United States, and the 21st of October is the Melbourne stop on the tour. Uh, it's a short film, 25 minutes. Uh, the director will be here, and we'll have a brief panel discussion at the end of the film, uh, moderated by the director. We're hoping to have uh, a number of a couple of local officials, a couple of business leaders, president of the Chamber of Commerce, perhaps the pastor from one of the local uh, congregations and so forth, like a cross-section, in other words, of uh, people of Brevard that might have something to say about their perspective on what sea level rise uh, might do uh, to coastal communities, and particularly ours. So 
That's the story. October 21st, Friday at the Lagoon House. Meanwhile, uh, we're on a mission. Uh, we're spending a lot of time uh, writing letters to our Congressman Posey and other people uh, to nudge along a proposal for a uh, revenue neutral carbon tax, which we think we're going to be able to get introduced in the Congress uh, in uh, 2017. Uh, this is a steadily increasing tax on carbon at the source as it comes out of the mine, the well, or across the border. And what's unusual about it, and, and the reason we think that we will be able to get Republican sponsorship, is that it returns all of the revenues uh, in the form of a monthly check to American households. Hmm. So the two-thirds of the economic spectrum are protected against the price changes that they're going to find in the, in the cost of electricity, the gas at the pump, and, uh, and that, that sort of thing. Um, so I say we're optimistic. Uh, in order to get through the Congress, it's going to have to be introduced by uh, a Republican Congress, when we're pretty sure. Uh, but we think we've got a couple of likely uh, people to do that from an organization in the Congress called the Citizens Cl the uh, Climate Solutions Caucus. There are now 20 members of that caucus in the House, 10 Republicans and 10 Democrats. And it's a Noah's Ark kind of deal. If you're a Democrat and you want to join, you've got to bring a Republican with you. <laughs> <laughs> and we think these are the people that are going to be uh, the initial sponsors of the uh, legislation. All right. So thank you. Hope to see you on the 21st of October. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further public comment? All right. So uh, item four, a staff update on sustainability initiative. Yes, sir. I put myself on the agenda. So I can update you all. Um, speaking of climate change, <laughs> the city is in the third phase of our climate change project. And uh, we have a stakeholder workshop this Friday, which is kind of an invite of, you know, uh, leaders throughout Brevard County that would have some type of impact on our climate work, um, kind of like the Brevard County sewer utility um, FPL, things like that, and we'll be um, having a luncheon with them and working through some of the um, issues that we're facing. Um, that project is part of a Stetson University grant with um, Sea Grant, Florida Sea Grant, and um, uh, Dr. Jason Evans is the project lead on that project, and he is doing their, we're basically GIS mapping all of the city's critical infrastructure, and we're also looking at all the elevations of the residential properties throughout the city um, as, it, as it pertains to floodplain management. Um, so our, our city lobbyists will be there as well um, on the federal level um, to try to help us work through any issues that we need to work through later. Um, we have, I have a piece of paper on your, on the dais that um, is from Jennifer Wilster with um, um, regarding the Keep Brevard Beautiful uh, River Fest. And this is on November 12th in Coca Village and they're asking if we would like to participate in that with a booth. So if you do, let me know and let me know when you want to work at the booth. So I'm not the one that's stuck there all day. <laughs> um, other organizations that are there are listed, Anglers for Conservation, Animal Love Inc., Brevard County Natural Resources Management, Brevard Zoo, Canat World National Seashore, City of Cocoa, conser Water Conservation, so on. So if that's something that interests you, um, they would like to know an answer in mid, probably early October is what she was asking. So um, 
if you want to revisit this at the end of the meeting, I just, you know, if you all want a booth, then we can set that up for you as staff, but we just need some assistance in manning that booth. I'll be at that event as part of another charity group that I work with, mm -hmm. so I'm happy to cover for part of the day. Okay. Um, just I couldn't do it the whole day because I'd have to be double mm -hmm. duty. But I'm in. Actually, that you know was a good trial run, as it were, if we're going to do anything at the uh, Founders Day. Wouldn't it be after the Founders Day? November 12th is when. The meetings for the. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Well, then Founders Day becomes the precursor. <laughs> we don't need a uh, we don't need a roll call vote on whether or not to do this. We can just uh, I think you were saying we can discuss this at the end of the meeting. Yeah, if you want to just let me just think about it. If that's okay. something you all want to do, um, I guess what we would bring is. You know, some of the initiatives, just initiatives that we're doing. Um, if we have bags ready by then. Um, stuff like that. So we have a banner now. We ordered a banner for our booths for the sustainability board. Um, so we're trying to prepare you all for that. <coughs> um, we have passed several projects since our last meeting. Um, we have, this is not a uh, sustainability board initiative, but it is environmentally related. We are going to have a controlled burn at the sports park for the um, environmental preservation area that's next to the skate park. Um, so that will occur in the next couple months. You'll see that happening. Um, we're hoping that brings back the turtles and the you know, wildlife that's there. It's very overgrown. Um, we also have approved a city hall planting at the, the stormwater pond right here in partnership with the Marine Resources Council. We're trying to start pulling back the St. Augustine grass from the edge of the water, um, trying to be the example. I get beat up on Facebook a lot for not being the example. So um, we're going to be the example. So that um, is also in partnership with Nick. He's put, helped us put all the... Um, you know, specifics together, and I think the date for the planting is December, December 10th. 10th. That's right, December 10th. So just a week after. Where is that going to be again? December Here at City Hall. Oh, okay. And they're partnering with Surfrider and um, KBB. Um, KBB and putting out big notices, come help plant and volunteer, and so we'll try to get people interested and in, in educate them on how, you know, what we're doing and why. Um, so that, that was approved, and they're preparing all that now. Um, we have a, you, in your previous meetings, you had asked for um, the city to start looking at our codes um, and trying to update parts of them that are clearly outdated and don't conform with sustainability initiatives. Um, and we gave some examples like stormwater where we require it to go all off the property and we should be containing it on the property, stuff like that. Um, I wanted to introduce you to the consultant that we hired to do that, and that's Rochelle Lawendale. She lives in the city. She lives on your street, <laughs> on Sherwood. Oh, <laughs> so she's a seasoned Halloween participant. Um, my second year. Yeah. We stop by her house every year. <laughs> um, and Rochelle's um, been a long um, Long-standing urban planner in Brevard County. She's one of the first urban planners I met when I moved here, when we moved back here, um, and has done many projects with me in the past. So she's very good at what she does. And um, she, we, we signed an agreement where she's going to give us first a report um, by looking through our code and and pointing out sections that need to be updated and provide us with that report, and then we can decide what we want to do from there. Um, so, um, did you want to introduce any, say anything more? Or? No, it's just, I would just add that, you know, I had the privilege of serving on the Planning and Zoning Board here for, I don't know, 13 or 15 years and uh, helped start the Redevelopment Agency and served as chair of the, the Redevelopment Advisory Board. And um, I, I guess my claim to fame is Halloween, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have had the privilege of living in Satellite Beach since 1988 and serving on many of the boards. 
uh, for a long time and doing a lot of the planning and mm -hmm. uh, redevelopment uh, here in the community as well as in, throughout the county for 37 years. So it's a pleasure to meet you all and to be doing this and working with uh, your staff and yourselves. And I would welcome the opportunity to meet with each of you individually um, to talk about you know, some of your own thoughts and ideas and, and goals and concerns and issues uh, so that I can keep an eye out uh, for those things as I move through this project for you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, the only other thing is I, I do, I am preparing a letter to Publix to um, admonish them for not getting back with us participating in this recycle bag program. So I am going to be prepared <laughs> and um, so that will go out this week. Um, and I think that's all I have. Any, uh, any uh, public comment on any of that? What was the date of the planting to get the home? December 10th. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. I have one more thing. <laughs> sorry. Um, the city council did pass your styrofoam uh, resolution, and or ordinance actually. We created an ordinance, um, so that will basically be um, prohibiting any vendor that the city sponsors for an event from using styrofoam products, and will prohibit the city from actually purchasing and spending city funds on styrofoam products. Um, we did get um, some styrofoam companies that found out about this ordinance <laughs> and wanted to come and speak with you, and I said no. So um, I didn't want to get <laughs> I didn't want to get our city um, council or your, our boards involved in you know deciding um, you know having to field that. So if we believe, I said we made a decision. We're, we're moving forward. So if you have any problem with that, <laughs> let me know. No. Um, uh, and so to now I'm done. <laughs> Uh, any uh, any questions or comments from board members on any of those? I am uh, I'm really uh, personally really glad to uh, to meet Rochelle and and uh, you know and, and hear that we're you know getting some you know some legitimate I don't know what you would call it but rubber meets the road type of action on that. I think that's going to be really, I think that's going to be really something. It's, it's going to be interesting to me that uh, I'm, j I'm just willing to bet that we'll, we'll encounter a few things where we, where we have pushback, you know, some mm -hmm. significant pushback from some people, but, uh, you know, time's come. <laughs> and I, you know, just to add on um, from a city operation standpoint, we have started to move like the only the only parts of our um, operations in which we use fertilizer or pesticides primarily is our football and fields, our athletic field. And we have started moving towards an, an organic solution. We stopped pretty much using all together Roundup and started with the vinegar and the recipe that you gave us um, you. for that. So there's some movement there that we're starting to change, and we've been, Sally Scalera with the Extension Service has been really pretty instrumental in helping us along with that. Um, so we are moving forward from a city operation standpoint on, on trying to get a lot of that done. So. Well, and I, I, I think probably everybody here really appreciates that because I think for, the, for any of us to, you know, for this board to be successful in uh, mm -hmm. any of that, I, I think it would be really hard, you know, with... <laughs> You know, with, uh, with us not, you know, mm -hmm. leading. Yeah, exactly, practicing what we preach. Yeah. It is, it is yeah. actually a lot harder than, than you think to, to move to those systems. Um, when you, you know, like we, we with particular pavers and, and, and not using some type of weed killer with pavers too hard to do. Um, so, so we just quit putting pavers in. <laughs> Um, which actually has a negative effect on stormwater, so uh, in percolation. So it's it's that you know balance that you have to, to take. So it's a lot. There's a lot of thought. There's a lot of things people don't think about. You know. Oh, uh, before we move off this, I would like to ask one thing, uh, Rochelle. Uh, forgive me, Ms. Lawndale's. Uh, you mentioned uh, you know being interested in speaking with the board members individually or. Anything like that? Is it possible for us to have, uh, you know, kind of an informal? Well, if we're all, we can't have any kind of informal meeting, can we? We're, we're individually. Board. You can have individually. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Do you think that it would be uh, a good idea for us to have a mm -hmm. an additional meeting that's not informal but a regular, you know, sunshine law proof meeting that we can brainstorm with or not necessary? I, I mean, if I, I'm happy to do however you and the board want to do. If you want to just do a workshop. Or I if guess you, that's what I mean. Really. Or if you, brainstorming workshop. or I'd be glad to, you know, a, a time that's convenient for everybody. Let's say, you know, on a Friday afternoon, and the doctor is in, you know, mm -hmm. for 30-minute um, sessions or however. You know, there's a lot of ways we can work that out, mm -hmm. whatever's convenient, or in an evening if, uh, yeah, I think if that's it, better. I think that would work better because it's harder for them to know what to look for until they get that first report, you know. If you want to wait till then, yeah. there are some things that I would like to have to know from them before as I'm doing it. You know, as I'm kind of culling through things, there may be things that they've thought about that I need to hone in on or mm -hmm. look at. So I'm happy to to do that while we're in this phase. Okay. May we have a period of time, like starting tomorrow, that you know we encourage all us board members to email things, you know, like things that we've thought about with regard to that that might be worthwhile, and Julie can, or we can know we can email you directly. Then. Well, I I would encourage you to do that through your through Courtney, mm -hmm. okay. and then she can you know forward it on to me. That way, she's kept abreast of everything, and and it, it all goes through mm -hmm. her. Um, or if you want to email me directly, just copy her. You know, that's okay. fine too. Thank you. Hey, um, I'm sorry. Is there a pen down there somewhere that I can send my way? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Next item of business, uh, discuss take action on uh, sustainability uh, assessment. Do we have, uh, I suppose we'll have a, an address from probably Dr. Lindemann. Oh, I'm sorry, forgive me. I, did. I was wondering why. Uh, and I promise you that was not <laughs> Forgive me, uh, uh, number five, discuss take action on uh, beautification board plan sale. I'm oh, sorry. That's quite all right. And I'm Kay LaRue, the chair of the beautification board. Thank you. And we are going to be having a, we're calling it the Coastal Garden Fair, March 18th. And we were hoping to get some help from you all as far as manpower. And we did want you to have a booth that maybe talked about the community garden and anything else you all might want to hand out pamphlets or anything for. And on the little list of the people that we had in consideration, Sherry with the bat houses, we have already contacted her. I had Jeff's name next to that, so Nancy went ahead and talked to her. So that's already been handled there. But... Um, under manpower, we had y'all listed, and we're just wondering if there was anyone that would be able to give us help there. It's going to be from 9 to 2 on a Saturday at the uh, Schechter Center. But if you had any other people that you thought might work out with this, anything that had to do with gardening or garden art, um, we'll, we'll definitely take your recommendations. And we had Anglers for Conservation down for the Love Our Lagoon signs, but I wasn't sure if that was something you all had access to and could have at your booth. I actually have signs in my car for you all, by the way, <laughs> um, for the um, tax, I'm sorry. But, yes, we can bring those to you. Okay. Should I still invite them, or would that cover the I think the Anglers sign? would love to have a booth. Okay. Wouldn't they? I will yeah. check. Yeah. I will ask Mike. Okay. Thank I will you. send something your way then. Please. But that was basically all we were wondering is if you all wanted to have a booth, we would gladly welcome you. Are there any questions about the fair? Or? I guess the question is whether you have an interest in it. Sure. Oh, absolutely. And also okay. Maple Street Natives? Do you um, they said they couldn't do it because you'd have to have a, a booth with someone there and they're, they're, busy. they're busy that day. Yeah. I will ask my superiors. Okay, great, great. Have you reached out to Bill DeLucha of Surf Rider yet? Uh, no. Bill DeLucha. Big fan of ocean-friendly gardens. I think it'd fit in. 
And how do you spell it? Oh, good question. Um, on the spot. Uh, D E L U C C I A. Sounds good. We can send you the email, his email, great. if you'd like. Okay. That'd be great. All right. But that was all I had. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, definitely have a booth here. Yeah. And do, so should we uh, maybe put an agenda item on our next meeting to discuss what we're gonna what we're gonna have in our booth and that sort of stuff? Or I think you should have. To, I would highlight the community garden because I think you'll be pretty far along with that, and maybe you can get some participants to rent out space. Right? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I mean, I definitely. Oh, nice. Yeah, I've yeah, never been to the. Maybe we definitely have some photos and stuff, uh, like progression type photos of the project itself and everything like that. Get volunteers and donations. Mm. That sounds good to me. <coughs> Any other board member comments on that? Do we, uh, Courtney, do we need to have a roll call vote on, on this item? Do you guys have an interest, then we'll start setting it up for you and planning it for you. Okay. <coughs> Calling you all to figure out which hours you all want to be there to sit at the booth. As my public works say, it would say, my director, is it going to be a sustainability board booth or a Courtney and Julie booth? That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. another question. Would be, <laughs> but you've also got the uh, Samson's Island board. Is this something that they might be interested in playing with, too? I don't know. we got somebody here that could talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I think we definitely have to be there. I mean, that's no question. It's a no-brainer for us. I mean, we have to show up. We have to support the community. We have to be a part of this. We want to get the word out and educate people. This is the platform for us. Mm -hmm. We have to do this. We have to commit to it. I'll, I'm committed. I'll be there. March 18th is kind of a... Far enough away. It's, it's, <laughs> I can plan for it now. <laughs> Which means we'll start planning on February. <laughs> right. So I'll be on it. I think it's a great idea. I think we need to be a part of the program. Well, what about, was, but I don't remember, program. was Keeper Vard Beautiful on there? Mm, they're already on there, I think, right? right? Okay. Yeah. Hmm. All right, so uh, next item of business, uh, discuss, take action on uh, sustainability assessment. Um, so I guess we'll uh, first ask if there's any uh, public comment on that particular item, and then, uh, then we'll have... Uh, Dr. Lindeman? Dr. Lindeman, who's going to present it? You want me to do this? Or is it um, I was not told to present anything. I'm going to answer questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, sorry, I'm sorry about that. This is, um, why don't you come up and share with me? <laughs> As you recall, we were creating a long range sustainability plan. Mm -hmm. um, this is the sustainability assessment, which is the first phase where we Basically, when we move into the planning phase and decide what parts of um, sustainability issues we want to focus in on, um, we need something to measure what we're doing at that time. So what FIT has done for us is put together a series of um, assessment and measurements that we would use in that process. And um, did you want to present those? Well, look, okay. My understanding was my role tonight was to answer mm -hmm. questions, but I would be happy to give you a short overview and briefing. So uh, I believe the, the full report was included in the appendix for the uh, agenda. I can tell you that there is a color version of it that if you're interested in that version, which some of the figures are a little more legible, you can get that from Julie. Uh, in short, this follows up on something we discussed previously. Uh, the city is working on developing a city sustainability plan. And in order to develop a robust city sustainability plan that is more than arm-waving, uh, as some of the plans are, 
Uh, we decided after a lot of deliberation to have a two-phase process. Phase one would be the sustainability assessment report, which was what is in your agenda, and that is now completed. The assessment report developed a series of benchmarking categories, subcategories, met metrics, indicators, which are captured most fundamentally in Appendix 3 of the document. Uh, this document, as we've said many times uh, among ourselves and in part to you, is the backbone of the city's sustainability plan. So the way we usually can build technical documents is you construct a backbone, you construct a framework, and then it's a lot easier to hang the meat on the bones if you have the right bones in the right places. So uh, a student from FIT did, Jessica, who you might remember, mm -hmm. uh, did most of the work on this with the assistance of Zach Eicholtz, who is, Zach, could you remind them who you are? You've met Zach before. Zach is now continuing on the city sustainability plan using the assessment report as the spinal cord. Um, so key findings in this plan are summarized in the summary on page 18. Uh, we identified, as you might recall, you folks reviewed this spinal cord in early development. There are five primary categories of, of indicators. There's the built environment, there's land and water, there's energy and transportation, there's quality of life, and there's community outreach. And each of those five primary categories has from five to eight <coughs> subcategories. And there's a figure on page 18 that breaks that down showing the number of ultimate indicators that were identified within each subcategory. So you might recall when we first talked about this, uh, when you're doing sustainability at the scale of the city, you have a lot of things to measure. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of things to measure at multiple scales. And as we've talked about, I will not be surprised if one of you three weeks from now emails me with something we missed. That's the way it often works. Right now, the, so the totals are, and, and the most important part of the document, arguably, is in the appendix. That's where these documents often are. And that's appendix three. This is the eight-page matrix, which stratifies very, very clearly the five primary categories, the five to eight subcategories within, and then goes into the meat and potatoes, which are the indicators, and then the metrics for those indicators. So in total, there are 121 indicators broken down among the five primary categories. And there are more than 121 metrics because some of these indicators you can measure in two or three ways. So in a lot of city sustainability plan exercises, and we went through the literature pretty thoroughly, um, this level of benchmarking isn't done up front. We feel very comfortable and, and pleased, I believe, that we did this level of benchmarking because the city sustainability plan now has all of this level of measurement detail to work from. Importantly, in Appendix 3, which is the eight-page matrix, it's all broken down by each level we talked about, and which you folks reviewed in early stages, um, near the right margin, there is a category called priority of that indicator, right? So we're not into just firing the shotgun and blasting you guys with 100 metrics. Uh, we have to engage in triage and identify which metrics to prioritize. So Professor Barker, which is an apt title for her, uh, with Dr. Fergus and um, uh, Alan, uh, Professor, oh, I'm losing his last name. Potter. Thank you. I was thinking now. And Professor Potter, a public works director, did a lot of uh, uh, grinding on this. And so the priorities that are indicated there were based on both, uh, quote, generic importance, A, and B, the cost and or ease of measurement. And then you, we put those together to re, uh, determine an ultimate priority. The ultimate primor priorities ultimately were determined by probably the three most knowledgeable people in the city, and that's mm -hmm. Professors Barker and Potter and Dr. Fergus, with a lot of help in the background from us. So. Uh, that's where we're at currently in terms of the assessment report. Your comments are certainly encouraged. Uh, next steps are underway. Um, Zach is working with myself and city staff to 
draft the sustainability plan for the city, which will be the first city sustainability plan that I'm aware of for a barrier island city in East Central Florida. It will have as an operational spinal cord this document, particularly Appendix 3. But there will be more to it. There will be a lot of interesting meat and tissue that we're hanging on the bones. We're looking to have a draft to you folks by late October or early November with a hopeful close date by the end of the calendar year. I'm happy to take any Correct questions. Great impromptu presentation. That was great. Yeah. <laughs> any questions? I need to read it. I think what, um, by doing this, this assessment, um, what we've avoided or will avoid later, and what I think a lot of cities do wrong is when they, they begin the planning process, um, they want to accomplish a certain task, and then they, they bring their, when they start drilling in and they want to measure their success, they find that they're unable to because the data is not there, they're unable to get it, it's too difficult, it's too expensive, um, and then they run into the problem of not being able to show their success. And then in this case, we've figured out that in advance to be able to say, you know, if we want to measure that or if we want to go after this particular strategy, um, at least we know which ones are measurable, which, what data is easier to get, how, how we're going to measure it up front. So um, that in many ways, and I know that sounds terrible, but sometimes that drives your strategies because you do want to show the community, particularly if you're going to spend a lot of money, that you are making some success. So um, they did a great job and we're very pleased with the results. So thank you. Sure. Um, very importantly, Appendix 3, I encourage you to print out those eight sides and just stick them in your pocket and look at them once in a while. Uh, our task wasn't to begin all of the measurement. Uh, what, our, what we've done is we've stratified what's out there and we've prioritized what to measure. We've also done preliminary um, me benchmarking on measurement. But this is a process that moves forward. So in the considerations that you folks are going to be examining moving forward, one of them is going to be, and we'll be talking about this more when we get you the draft sustainability plan, is what is it that you folks are going to suggest that the city focuses its measurement resources on? Now, interestingly, what we found was that a lot of these metrics are relatively measurable without great time or money. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll see how that holds up. Mm -hmm. But you know, putting more measurement uh, responsibilities on top of very buried city staff is tenuous potentially. And and you know, I might be suggesting, or Professor Barker might be suggesting to you in the not too distant future that a little money needs, needs to be allocated to get some of the more specialized measurement taken care of. I, I just, I don't have an agenda. I don't know for sure, but you should be keeping that in mind. So when you're allocating 5K here and 5K there or 3K here down the road, it might be that there's going to be a, a, a potential need for something like that to get some of the more difficult things measured over time. Some of this stuff is, requires real specialized work or just it requires a lot of time. One last comment. Um, after the meeting, uh, I just wanted to give you uh, a, a heads up, Dave Vigliotti. Um, FIT has a very active residence life program in sustainability. Zach is one of the leaders of that program. He's the president of the sustainability committee within the Res Life program at FIT. They are building an ambitious and unprecedented initiative at FIT to create sustainable living and learning communities, dorms that are specialized on sustainability. Um, so it's a big lift. We don't have new buildings that are LEED certified or anything. But after a lot of work, uh, Zach and next to him is Alexis Miller, who's also from Res Life at FIT and another leader in this. They are with others. We've gotten approval. There was a small grant that's been funded. FIT is going to start its own community garden. And uh, it's going to be one of the first products of the sustainable living and learning community that Zach and Alexis have been the leads on. The reason to mention this is I mentioned earlier that there's FIT and satellite beach uh, you know, connections that may continue to surface. Um, it makes sense that they're starting this garden in the next month or two. It should be built, hopefully, by the end of October with raised bed structure. 
that perhaps their community gardening folks could be talking with the city's community gardening folks. And having Nick on your community gardening committee sounds great. Perhaps you might want to have Zach on your committee as well, not trying to overload you. And what I was thinking is over time, perhaps this would be an opportunity to create a sister community garden relationship. First, perhaps, between the city of Satellite Beach and Florida Tech, which is very much like the city. Mm -hmm. And perhaps other community gardens in the county could be identified. Mm -hmm. And maybe there could be ultimately a series of like sister cities, sister community gardens, and maybe there could even be a community garden, a Space Coast community garden network. Because community gardens are hard. It's hard to really produce bushels of broccoli, mm -hmm. as you know. It's hard. And, and uh, maybe with everybody lifting, we can produce even more bushels of broccoli. So that's a suggestion, and afterwards we'll introduce you to Zach and Alexis. And I just should mention that next to Alexis is Terrence, who is, has no direct connection but is coming here out of his own interest. He's from Satellite Beach. He went to Satellite High, mm -hmm. and he's in, the intro, he's in the sustainability minor. So Terrence, you're... you're attendance here several times is awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe we can get you, rope you into some of this. Uh, with us. Us. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For any, uh, any public comments, on this particular item? I think you had your hand up a moment ago, Nick. Um, I, just, I guess my question is more for Ken or for you guys as well. Uh, wh is this available to the public? When will it be available to the public? Uh, is it open for public comment, or is this an in-house issue? Mm -hmm. no, no, I don't think anything we do is like, yeah. strictly You can have it. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Oh, well, thank you. If there's no objection, we could release the PDF through our Facebook page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that way, get more comment. No problem. So send, send that to me, and I can put it up for you. Do it so you can hey, you look in printing. Can you send out the color version? Yeah, there's just. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look in the. Um, the appendices uh, is messed up. Yeah, it's printed yeah, when it should have been landscaped. That's what happened to me in reading the summary, you know, on the computer and then printing it out and thinking, okay, I'll finish that up, and yeah. then I could only see half of it. Right. So it kind of it's okay. me feeling. But if you look at the last, some last pages, you'll see a graph and the data for the water consumption, and you see how it's listed out by city facility. Um, so that type of data will guide the decisions of the city when we decide, let's say, if we're going to reduce water consumption, we're probably not going to focus on DeSoto. We're probably going to focus on the DRS center, considering that's the highest water use. So that's the type of data that you need to, like, just in the beginning, um, not necessarily at the end, but, you know, not only is it to measure your success, but to show you where you're going to do it, you know, how, how you're going to spend the money. Any other, any further public comment? Um, you know, I don't know, uh, I don't know what uh, what action we take on this here tonight. I mean, we accepting it. Yeah, yeah we're just mm -hmm. accepting it. We don't need a vote or of any sort for that. I mean, it is it is kind of interesting, and, and honestly, really, uh, you know, really feels. Uh, well, rewarding is the right word, but I mean, it really does feel kind of rewarding. I mean, when we first when we first formed this board, I mean, this was this was kind of the big thing, and uh, getting Dr. Lindemann and the other folks from FIT to you know to, to get involved and, and produce the assessment force and everything. I mean, that not, nothing was nothing was going to happen without that. Yeah. So, really, well, thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, next item of business, uh, discuss, take action on balloon ban. Any, uh, you have a staff input on the balloon ban? We received an email from Commissioner Barfield's office 
about um, the possibility of whenever there's a countywide interest in anything sustainable, everybody calls us. <laughs> so um, they basically sent it over and copied us to see if we were doing anything on that issue. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we brought it to your attention and to see if that was something you want us to look into. Um, so uh, we included that. That's the email from Elizabeth Allward. She is the legislative aide to um, Commissioner Barfield. And um, if you didn't know, Commissioner Barfield is one of the more um, environmentally aware county commissioners um, in Cooper Bar County. So um, I think they were hoping that we would take up that issue and provide, and, and if we did, um, kind of be the example that other areas of the county could look at. So you might, you might want to read that, digest it. We don't have to rush it, so you could bring it back at your next meeting if that's something you want to do. I read it and I was a little unclear on what they were saying. Um, it looked like some places were just banning on specific beaches and it looked like they just did like a trial on one beach. And are we talking about banning balloon releases? Yes. Specifically on the beach? Um, you could limit it to the beach if that's something you want to do or um, there are some cities that limit it, banned it altogether. Um, so any balloon going up in the air would be considered illegal. And that, that primarily is not going to apply to the little kid that lost his balloon. Um, that's going <laughs> to, you know, we're not going to have the police. <laughs> um, what it will do is um, limit the events that specifically purposely release them up in the air for some reason. So that would be the reason. Yeah, I'm definitely for this ban. I, I walk the beaches on Pelican Beach um, daily. And at least weekly, I see balloons and I pick them up. I have a little garbage bag. And I pick up balloons, and it's horrible. Of course, it kills our loggerhead sea turtles. It's the worst thing in the world. I, you know, go to Disney World, and I guess, and release your balloons. Um, but I think in Satellite Beach, with our ocean, we should ban it. Makes sense. My only question is: the, is the um, how often are these balloon releases done? Is this common, or, or is it? Or does the trash come from kids losing their balloons and people on the, you know, mm -hmm. at Pelican Park having birthday celebrations? And In Satellite Beach, it's very uncommon for yeah. anybody to release balloons. I think um, if just from a staff perspective, if anybody asked to do that, our, even our recreation department would be like, mm -mm -mm, you know. Um, but what I think the county and everyone else in the county is looking for is to, to, to create the document that everybody else can use. Um, so coast, uh, on the coast, it's very common. Um, there was a group recently that um, won a fight about this um, in, in their own community because they had an event there that um, was a tradition that they did a balloon release. Um, so it's not really that big of a deal here, honestly, um, from an yeah. like, uh, event perspective. Um, and, and if you did want to do something like this, we could put, you know, um, the signage at the beach saying, you know, please don't release your balloons and stuff like that. We could do that anyway. So you don't need a ban to, for us to do that. Um, so it's up to you. It's all up to you on how you want to handle that. And we could bring it back at the next meeting and provide those specific options on how you could go about it, and we'd be happy to do that. So it would seem it would be more palatable if we did like on the uh, reusable bags to do more educational than punitive or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're not going to solve it overnight. And we also, I'm sure, a lot of those balloons come from the mainland. Who knows where? It depends on how the winds blow. Uh, if we can begin, if we can take action that's palatable to people and doesn't tick them off, and then that may be something other communities such as Melbourne or Cocoa that are much farther away from the ocean uh, can, you know, can emulate also uh, as opposed to just banning them. You walk into Publix up here, turn right, and there's a whole wall of balloons and a big cylinder helium. 
Yeah, my my kids get them every time they go in there. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't. <laughs> I think it's when they rent the, when they rent the space from the Pelican Park um, facility that we have. I think the weddings and things like that. They have all the balloons when they go out there for the weddings. I think those are just they fall off and yeah, they're yeah. just those kind of balloons. But again, it could be things like just doing some signage here and there that you know, like at the clubhouse. Right. You know, please contain your balloons or whatever type thing. You know that that uh, uh, you know, secure them well and then take them with you type thing. Well, like Dave, I'm I'm personally all for it. Uh, you know, on the other hand, I have to say in the, you know, only the, I suppose, six years that I've lived here in Satellite Beach, I don't believe that I've ever witnessed a, you know, you know, one of those things like at a wedding where somebody releases a hundred white balloons or, you know, that kind of thing. I, and so I kind of feel like if we're, if we're going to, you know, ask the city council to take action on something like that, that we, uh, um, that we'd be a little more thoughtful about it and make sure that it's something that actually is going to have an effect on where it's coming from. I mean, I see balloons on the, I mean, you go out in a boat fishing and you see at least four or five of them floating, you know, five or six miles offshore, those mylar kind. And, you know, you can't, you can't walk down the beach at low tide without running across, you know, five or six latex balloons. And, uh, and I, yeah, and I don't think they're coming from, you know, from one big party that releases them or, or something like that. And I, I wonder, you know, how, how would you really get at that? I mean, you, you're just gonna, you're just gonna ban balloons outdoors? Well, there's, there's different um, strategies. So there's some um, communities that focus on the actual release into the air. There's some communities that like the South Florida coastal communities that are focusing on um, banning balloons on the beach, like just not allowing people to have them there. Um, there's some communities that aren't banning them, but actually just putting out educational materials at the beach. Um, and sometimes cities like to start with that um, and then move to a ban if that doesn't yeah. work. You know, so. I was going to say, uh, one of the parts of the uh, plastic video series actually addresses the balloons. So that's going to be in that series. So if we wanted to try to time that with something, we could do that. And I'd really like to change the verbiage. I think banning is a word that's very scary to right. people. I prefer, I absolutely despise that word, and yeah. I don't like to use it in my own vocabulary, and I think that it scares people, and it, and it gives us a bad book when we're just banning stuff, when, you know, maybe we need to just use a lighter way of saying what we're trying to say. I mean, I've picked up tons of balloons. I've actually been, as a kid, on balloon releases, mostly up at Paradise. <laughs> you know, that's what they usually have. But I think they're another awful thing for the environment. I do think we just need to be really careful about how we go about applying it and, and putting it out there. We don't want people to be like, this is the board that just bans everything fun for kids, and they're going to all hate us. Mm -hmm. So just, I think we should just be careful. Personally. Well, yeah, the bubbles. Well, I agree with that, and that's, and that's the like thing. I mean, so we'll we'll have a we'll have a, a, a citywide ban of something, you know, that uh, you know the, that this board will essentially take the heat for. That also is not effective because it aims at something that's not really what's causing the problem. If I'm understanding the situation correctly, um, we don't have some major epidemic of kids tossing their balloons in the air. That's, right. not, what, that's not what this is about. Right, but that's not what this is really about. If I'm understanding correctly, it's about the opportunity to set precedent, the opportunity mm -hmm. to set that example. So I would like to take some time and do a little more reading and thinking and come back and talk about this next meeting with a little bit more uh, research behind us. I think we could yeah. find a compromise maybe. One question that comes to my mind is, do they make biodegradable balloons? In other words, excellent question. If it gets loose, <laughs> in two weeks it's gone. I've been looking for that and I haven't found it anywhere. Found it's no. a but aren't those like those paper lanterns? Those are fairly, because they burn up and then eventually disintegrate. Like just if you want to do that, to the little paper floaty lanterns. I mean, I don't know what like the environmental impacts of those are, but. 
Imagine you going back somewhere and getting it into the pine flat. Well, yeah, we're talking about on the beach. <laughs> yes, you're right, you're right. <laughs> well, typically they'll do them like off the coast. So like, if you have an interest, we can bring it back at your next meeting with some options and some examples of other communities in the South Florida area. Um, and maybe provide some you know, different recommendations that you can pick and choose from. That's what I'm inclined to. Yeah. I, would, I would go with that, yes. Yeah. Great. Any, uh, any public comment on that? Quick uh, public comment on the balloon issue. There's a wonderful website that you guys can check out. It's called balloonsblow.org. It's not for profit. It's down south in uh, Jupiter and Martin County, and it's run, been run for at least the past five to ten years to do exactly this, to educate people about balloons, paper lanterns, and the impacts of all these different things. So balloonsblow.org will hopefully help you guys get some of that information. Thanks. You know, yeah. I, along with that, I, I, I do. Yeah. It's always remarkable to me just how much play the city manager's Facebook page gets, you know, and how much, uh, you know, how much attention residents pay to that. And I, I think on something like that, along with, you know, before we, you know, before we put down a ban on something, uh, you know, we might, we might really undertake some, you know, some PR type work, some advertising, and some uh, education that will probably probably go a long way. All right, next item of business, uh, discuss take action on community garden recommendations. Have any uh, public comment on, uh, on that item? Okay. Would you like me to rip this, this out or would you like to do this? I think it's going to be one of you two for sure. One of us. I feel like can <laughs> I know I can feel. Um, okay. We did all. Did we get through? I'm not happy that we did this great if you will. Yeah, I can't be able to do this. With this group? No, I guess we yeah. didn't. So, in your previous meetings, you agreed to move forward with the community garden. There is a committee that was created, um, and the committee has come back with um, a list of eight recommendations for the community garden. Um, and if you accept those recommendations, we can move forward with the construction of the, of the community garden. Um, what we would do after this, if you did want to move forward, we would take this to council and apply a budget. So I just need to know if there's, if you want them all, all the things in here, and then we'll be able to price it out and send it on to council. Um, there's a layout. Where's the layout? The layout is in your packet. Yes? No? I think it was a packet. I didn't actually find it in my. Sorry. Lexi, I didn't grab it over there, though. I printed it from my email. <coughs> Thank you. The layout has raised beds constructed with 2 by 8 um, inch treated southern pine lumber, right? Yeah, and the southern pine is basically from Rockledge Gardens, that, um, so it has no chemicals in it that were, um, so it's going to sustain, it's going to be a, something that's going to be long term, it's not going to fall apart in one year. Um, they're 4 by 16s uh, with, I don't know if you want to go through all of this, are we going to go with um, 4 by 16 in each bed, and then there are four by fours to, to hold the corners, and then there's going to be rebar connected to that um, with these fasteners. Um, the, the plots were all numbered, you know, for each renter. We're just going to put numbers on each plot, so um, each person, because basically you're going to rent them per season, which is um, 50, roughly $50 per season that they could use them. Um, the beds were filled with 50-50 mix with mushroom compost and simple organic soil. Um, that was number two. Number three is watering um, with combinations that we talked about. We talked about 
um, having the um, the rain barrels. Um, how many did we talk about? We talked about 25, and we needed to buy them fairly soon because they were $10 each uh, that they've got us this special pricing. Um, so I, hopefully we can get approved of this and actually go get yeah, them. And we had a special way that we kind of designed on how that they stack up. Basically, there are two stacks of them. So there's 10 on top, 10 on the bottom. And, um, and basically, on the bottom, we had, was it cement that we used to kind of keep well, it? Well, that's the thing that we have to do with our now. We have to figure out a way to raise it up as high as possible, ideally, because the higher you get, the more yeah. pressure you get. And uh, but, yeah, you're talking about a lot of things. Some, some engineering involved. So we're using all the, um, from the racquetball court with the rain gutters going into there. Um, we're also using micro systems to automatically water um, with the rain barrels um, as well. But it's going to be kind of, it should be timed and orderly. Um, it's just one way that we can have success for our gardeners. Um, and also, number four is garden should include three bins of composting. It should have a system. So we're basically uh, providing, you know, different stages of compost. That's why there's three. Um, it's recommended that garden committee, um, we treat the garden with pests, so we use all organic pesticides, whether it's going to be just using peppers, red peppers grinded up or garlic spray. We're trying to be leaders in the community and not use pesticides, so this is the route that we're going to use. Um, it's just because if somebody's going to use Roundup next to you, and you're going to actually get Roundup. So <laughs> it doesn't make sense, and I think that we can do it ourselves. Um, also, we can recommend a shed um, so we can lock storage with tools and materials for things. Um, I think it makes sense. Uh, seven is near to be fenced if possible. I think that, of course, it wouldn't be a, um, it would just be like a baseball field fence, the wire fence, so you could, light can go through. Um, and um, try to keep some of the critters out. I know it's, when you start composting and gardening, and um, there's raccoons, there's possum, there's rats. I live right behind there. I know they live there. Um, we just don't want them. They're our friends, but we don't want them to eat our food and um, destroy our gardens. Um, also, Linda Seals is definitely um, somebody that gave me all this information. She's starting um, their garden. Their kickoff is, I have to look at my notes. Um, they're having the mayor there. Um, it's going to be at Wickham Park. Um, I have photographs and pictures of it um, if you'd like to take a look at it. Who's that kickoff? Um, I can find that, but the important thing was that we post rules on the community garden, um, just kind of rules of what we should do, things that we shouldn't do, mm -hmm. those types of things that um, just have a little, th just a plaque or something that we should have for rules that you shouldn't be doing certain things. I think it makes sense. Um, photographs I have, which are somewhere in here. But does anybody have any questions about any of those topics? I've got a little bit of input on uh, two items. Uh, rain barrels that I have, and you know, I've tried them a few different ways and everything like that, and uh, I have them currently on, uh, they're about two, well, I have a kind of a mound of dirt under it, but on that, you know, and that's probably only maybe eight inches high. But on that, I have them sitting on three courses of concrete block. And, you know, they don't have concrete poured in them or anything like that, but, you know, just lay them out in kind of a, I don't know, kind of an octagon or whatever, however many it takes, depending upon the diameter of the barrel, and then it's got it up two foot high, and then a regular, you know, regular spigot on the bottom. And uh, it, works, it works great. It works really good. But we play a lot of them. It'll be a, a control one that'll open a solenoid valve. That's the special special solenoid valve because it's very special. And then it will basically just um, 
flow out into all the beds, and each bed will have a, a ball valve where they can control the flow and know what they're growing or something. I, I did that with mine, and one thing that happens is as the you know as the water level in the in the tanks gets lower, uh, there's there's less pressure on it. So whatever time you have the thing set to you know stay open, um, it does. Yeah, the water doesn't come out as fast because there's not as much in there pushing. But um, and. One uh, one other little bit of input, and this is you know completely uh, you know a matter of opinion or whatever. But I built raised like just about any time I've grown vegetables in the past, I always use a raised bed, and I always make them four foot wide just because the lumber comes in eight foot pieces, and I always regret making them four foot wide because it's so far to lean over to whatever's in the middle. Yeah. I still do it, but I always regret it. <laughs> and I, I think it's something to consider, especially depending upon, I mean, if, you know, I'm 51. If you have folks that are 60 doing it, they might be, you know, leaning all the way over to work it in the middle might be, might be tougher. I was looking at the, um, the height of two, two by eights, so you stack that, and of course the two by eight is two or three inches. Yeah. So you're only, you're only gonna be, <laughs> 15 inches maybe. Um, and I don't think maybe we want to go higher than that. I, I always have used three. three yeah. yeah, the bottom one ends up about halfway in the ground by the time you're done putting it together. You know, because you have to level it out and everything. Yeah. So one corner goes down, the next thing you know, the, the bottom row is about half. Well, maybe we can round it to the ground and round it and dig it out so that it, it even gets a higher. You know, we might want to schedule a, a trip out there and have Public Works meet you out there. It's like some of the, the guys, I mean, they build stuff all day long, so they may have an idea on how to do that. That's a good call. Okay. So why don't we put a pump on the rain barrels? I mean, are they... I was trying to keep it as simple as possible. This is a big pump. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's something that could be added in the future. Yeah. Very, pretty easy to do. Um, it does, it'll, it'll control it a lot better. Yeah. It'll mm -hmm. control it a whole lot. You'll, you'll come out there after a dry spell and, you know, find your stuff. You don't have a problem on it. Yeah. yeah. And you've got to go some distance, too, because this is the problem I'm having at my house is my beds are way back on the back of my yard. My rain barrels are on my house, and we haven't started drip irrigation through the rain barrels. I'm filling up a thing and lugging it all the way down because I have to. I haven't put a pump on it, and I can't get them up high enough to to let gravity do the work. And it's kind of a pain in the butt to keep it regulated. It really is. Yeah, I have to look into your the problem and just zoom out about it. The time, you know, the quantity of water. And the more the more lines you have going, and the further it spreads out, and everything, every little every little place where there's a connection, or the line gets smaller, or whatever, it just and it, it's it's hard to balance so that you have you know the the right amount coming out every month. I basically pass it out of the lines, 15, 15 lines, one goes each bed, and then you keep that line. So it's very little restriction for passing it out. <laughs> well, actually, you may, on irrigation, consider the rule they use for uh, mm -hmm. duck work in a house. And that's it, constant velocity. In other words, when you have a big duck, and then you put in a vent, and then you reduce the size of the duct after the vent. So if you start it out like a two inch pipe and then drop up till eventually the very end, you're probably a half inch. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we would incorporate that. Did you all well want to try to schedule a trip out there? Because I think Public Works <coughs> is going to want to meet with you guys anyway, because um, so, they're going to, they're the, they're the ones that are going to price this out. So um, they, they're probably going to want to know exactly what you're looking for. Um, this is pretty specific, but, um, you know, 
with, particularly with the rain barrel issue, they're going yeah, to they're going to need to know that. Yeah. Okay. I think you really ought to look into those aerator tanks, like you and I were talking about before, as as an alternative to the smaller blue uh, barrels, because those things they just hold so much water, and it's so easy to set it up, and the overflow is easy to set up, and everything. And how much are they? I've never bought one new, so I don't have any idea. I got one free, and then I paid fifty dollars for the other one on Craigslist. But I, I think I have like four hundred gallons. Total. Yeah. Well, the rain barrels are good because for every resident can buy ten dollar rain barrels and put five or ten in their house, and they can use them, and that's what it's sustainable. These are from what aloe, aloe, aloe vera gel. gel. So what was in in these tanks? So it's not. So we're recycling, repurposing them, and reusing them. It's a great idea. It's for we're trying to be stewards um, to our community in this in this way that it might be a little bit more difficult for us to do, but I think it makes sense. But um, with Wickham Park, they're having a ribbon ribbon cutting October sixth at three p.m. So they're supposed to have the mayor there, and I would recommend highly that we go there and. Um, if we want Linda Seals to come to here and talk to us about her community garden, um, the one at um, UCF um, Extension Campus in Coco, and this one in Wickham, um, she's more than will, um, willing to come to talk to us and help us. Can you repeat the time again? The three. Oh, 3, 3 p.m. October 6th, which is... If anybody's planning on that, would you all want to meet a little earlier at the park with Public Works since you all be together anyway, be easier on us. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. 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 So maybe like um, if we need to be there at three, then we need to leave here at two thirty. So maybe like one forty-five. Is that too difficult, too early for y'all to get there? To meet here at the city or at the at the at the facility no, at, at the community garden site. I can do it. Okay. Is that okay? But this meeting is going to be at Wickham Park, right? So we'll meet at our facility and then go to Wickham Park. And then Park. go to Wickham Park, yeah. Okay. And you're addressing essentially a community garden committee, not necessarily the whole board? Um, yeah, if you don't want to be part of the engineering, <laughs> well, you know, no, or need to be. I just don't know yeah. that I can commit to yeah. something like that. If you don't need to be, then, then don't worry about it. Um, one forty-five. Yeah. Get me to my house. All right. Anything? Uh, anything further on that? Okay, uh, next, uh, discuss, take action on uh, recycling containers at beach accesses. Um, I think we had some uh, talk about this at our last meeting, mm -hmm. and I have a little bit of input on that, but I think, um, I think Dylan, you have something for us there? Uh, well, I've gone with Karen Cook first. So. Okay, I uh, recently at the um, uh, the, the once a month beach cleanup at Pelican, uh, you know, I had as my job for the day picking up um, cigarette butts with one of those little grabber thingies and uh, got me to thinking. And actually, I don't even remember where I heard it now, but there's a company called TerraCycle. Yeah, that's that's that I'm partnered with. I'm partnered with them on this project. Oh. They're the ones who's recycling it into apartments. Okay. Um, during the collection, and then they actually... The oh, the cigarette box? Yes. Oh, the whole thing is... For everyone that hasn't heard about this, it's a uh, cigarette box cycle container. They're going to be preparing at the boardwalks uh, and just key locations like library parks, things of that nature. And uh, so all the cigarettes are going to be recycled into park benches. The, uh, the butts on a cigarette, even though they look like cotton, are actually plastic, and uh, that's what's used to make park benches. And uh, I've partnered with another company that I mentioned, TerraCycle, which are the ones that actually are doing the, the actual recycling. <laughs> well, they let you ship the stuff there. They even pay for the shipping, I think. Oh, yeah. No, they're doing everything. Literally, I'm 
I just have to worry about the containers, the actual collection, everything of that nature, and they take care of the rest. And does the bottom come off of that very oh, easily? Yeah, the, the bottom comes off, I can take off the top. So the, the folks, uh, Kathy Shoda and her son Ethan, they said, uh, you know, very easily that stuff can be dumped into whatever kind of container you use for shipping. Yeah, well, actually, yeah. Yeah, they're going to be shipped in a sealed plastic bag inside the box. Yeah. But, I mean, that can be done on beach cleanup day at Pelican yep. on any yes. other. Well, they're going to be at all the port locks, so people can easily, either, you know, send a message or put them in here. Now, is that, is that fireproof? Yes, they are. All right. So, and there's also a, a video campaign going along with it, and the video series is going to start launching uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon. I've got one. Uh, I have it ready, and I was going to show up, but I didn't tell Julie in time that I, I wanted to present it, so we don't have the ability to present it. But it will be on Facebook tomorrow afternoon. Can you make one out of something besides PVC? Yes, I actually have intentions to get them to actually create recycled cigarette containers so that the containers are actually cigarettes themselves. Cool. That's, that's to come in the future. Well, I just re I just received an email about two seconds ago, and it says, my wife and I bought a lovely home just over a year ago off DeSoto Drive. I have lived many places, and Satellite Beach is, is the most squared away of them all. One thing that strikes me, though, with the importance of our beaches, with particular attention to the life cycle of sea turtles, I must say I did not know that turtles ate cigarette butts. This came as news to me, but since we seed the beach with them, I presume it helps increase the number of healthy, viable young turtles, since we seem to make sure they get so much of them to eat. <laughs> it's obviously sarcastic. <laughs> Very timely. <laughs> so I guess that we're, because I didn't, I didn't know any better, uh, I kind of registered with uh, their cycle. Yeah, so so we have, so we're we're so the city and the sustainability board are registered as two collection sites or whatever. But that's good. <laughs> well, I've already got all the collection sites handled. <laughs> okay. That's awesome. I think it's awesome. I just have to be used. It's a big culture shift. Yeah. Oh, I know. It's socially acceptable to literally just drop them. That's it. Yeah. People don't like, even want to go to 20 feet to acknowledge a container of trash can. So that's why we need to really consistently put these at every key location, because otherwise they're just not going to care. Yeah. So, and that's why this goes along with like an educational like video series that is going to try to draw some emotion and some, some shock about some of the truths about this and uh, get them on board. Okay, any, uh, any public comment on that? Project updates from uh, board members? I, I can get us going. Um, we approved a bag campaign a couple months back. I'm pleased to report that uh, that was, uh, well, so far, good news. They should be here for delivery somewhere in the second week of October. They've already been ordered, paid for, donations collected through Surfrunner. I uh, just want to put on the record, uh, we have an awesome city manager who not only reduced the city's liability, but actually increased the ultimate budget for the project. And if done properly, uh, this should be a revenue positive uh, project for both the city and uh, Surfrunner. So, outstanding. It was really Josh. No. <laughs> She's being polite. But um, we'll have them in hand. Um, October, there's two sets of them, and the date I got as of today is 10-6. So give or take a week or two from now, they should be in hand. Um, now, the good part, um, we had talked about doing this with Founders Day as our big rollout. Just food for thought. I don't know if there's any big objections to it, because nothing wants to be easy this year. The uh, state surf rider conference is also that same weekend as Founders Day. So the chairman of uh, surf rider suggested maybe, if there was no huge opposition, we could use this as part of the Orb uh, Festival, which is the Ocean Reef Beach Festival, which I believe is in December. I think it's about a month later. Um, we'd have full surf rider manpower to help with the campaign. Um, or we can still go forward with Founders Day. 
um, I'm pretty flexible. I was wondering, I don't know if there's anybody here on the board who wants to be more hands-on with it. If so, we could do another workshop just to discuss in more detail. I'd be happy to do that with anybody who wanted to just take some more time and talk about this campaign in a little more detail. Well, the S Sustainability Board <coughs> has a presence for founders today. We certainly do both. Just be part of it. Right, we could absolutely do both. We could absolutely do both as long as we have the manpower. And I don't, I don't imagine you need more than, you know, what, two or three people could absolutely cover it. Yeah, I mean, the only, the only issue with Founders Day is um, I'm very busy that day. Julie's not going to be able to help that day for that booth. Um, so the city staff, because we have so many other things to do for that festival, will not be able to be in that booth. So that would be up to the board. That now the December, the orb, yes, absolutely, I can sit at that booth all day long. Um, but we just have so many other responsibilities. I have to walk in the parade. Um, you know, a lot of the council members have to do the same. Um, so, you know, we won't be able to. Can we do that. this? Anybody on the board who's interested in volunteering for this on Founders Day, <laughs> send an email to Julie, mm -hmm. and then if there is interest, we'll do a workshop. Yeah. And if there isn't. Nobody will know, right. and it'll be. Yeah. We'll just move I think on. the orb um, has more of a, um, you know, connection, a con conceptual connection. Absolutely. You know? So I think that would be a great launch area. Sounds good. How many, how many hours does it have to be banned? Um, the Founders Day Marketplace is... Nine. Usually from nine to about three. Mm -hmm. I know Samson's Island is definitely going to be there, and we're going to be outside this year. Normally, we're inside with the crafts and all that stuff, which is awesome. I love all that stuff, but we just want to kind of be a little separate. We want to be near you guys, and hopefully, that we're going to be together or near each other with sustainability things like that. That we're going to be um, hopefully, but I could volunteer a, a small amount. Sure. Yeah, if we can get a few people to, you know, spend an hour or two. I'm, I'm, I can be there. <coughs> Nine to three, I'll cover it myself. So, we'll definitely have somebody there. I just wanted to see if anybody else wanted to get in on the fun. But <laughs> <laughs> for a little bit, I don't know what the schedule is like for that no day, but um, I'm in for that's kind of around here. I mean, I. I, I can say yes to a lot, but not without checking my own calendar first. Understood. Um, I believe we have one more meeting between now and Founders Day. Could I ask for an item on the agenda for next meeting to just bring more detail and get that organized for everybody? That's all I got. All right, and that'll bring us to our last agenda item. <clears throat> I had uh, Julie print out a set of mine going through what's happening on the program and that's probably useful to Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to report, I asked my wife if our FPO bill had come yet, and the answer is no. So I will have to share that next meeting. My first, have you gotten your first post-solar FPO bill? Um, yeah. What did it look like? If you don't mind us asking. It's twice what it was. What yeah. hell is this possible? <laughs> I want my money back. <laughs> um, I'd have to take a look at it. I know it was reduced. Excellent. Um, which I should be happy about, um, but I'd have to find it. No, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No I worries. thought you solar people had like an app on your phone that you can. I know Dave. Yeah. Yeah. I can show you how much you pay. <laughs> yeah, but I haven't gotten the actual bill yet. You know, where it all okay. comes down to the mm -hmm. beautiful goose egg on that bill. Theoretically, we'll see. We'll see. Well, the last time I looked, you were at uh, about one hundred and twelve dollars saved and twelve hundred pounds. Carbon dioxide offset. Not too shabby for a month's work. That was on the 14th. There you go. Half a month's work. Forgive me. Anything further on that? No, I think that uh, if you read the thing, there's, there's a lot going on photovoltaics, and if anybody's interested, one November in the evening, there's a meeting at the Schechter Center to kick them off a bunch of Okay. Uh, 
Any public comment on that? All right, so uh, agenda items for next meeting. You can just put one on there. Correct. Um, the staff would like to add the mosquito control issue. I'm getting more complaints about the spray than I am the mosquitoes, and I was wondering if that's something you all want to talk about. You can put the video on the agenda. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm perfectly on the video right. for this. Just tell them, hey, I want yeah. the attendance to play video. We probably should settle those, Josh. Oh, so you heard her. You heard her. That's, yeah, that's where it stops. She wasn't on it. She rules. We have, I have a trailer lined up for the parade. But if we're not going to use it, I need to release it. So are we? I do want to use that. Okay. And I want to begin a collection campaign of the reusable, or not the, the, the single-use plastic bags. I would like to collect as many of them as possible. Oh I have to make some calls to see how many we need to do a full float. Do you have the dimensions of the float? Or rather the trailer? Yeah. I, you sent it out in an email, right, at some point that I, I mentioned I had on my phone. I, I'll have to search. I can send you the Gotcha. You can get it to you and back to me. Just I'm trying to figure out how many of these things we need and if I can get that. It's like point. a six by eight or something like gotcha. that. Gotcha. Um, i got to check with Eric Schwartz, who's the uh, Rise Against Plastics coordinator for Surfrider. So he's the guy in the Surfrider end who will help with that float. Well, if you guys go up to Publix, they well, they'll give us as many as... Things, you know, they collect all the plastic bags. And they did already offer that we could use those. I could put it on Facebook and say that we're looking for plastic bags for oh, a float. The biggest question is like, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's my biggest question. Where can we put a receptacle to collect Here, I'll put Is it that okay? Yeah. Well, then I'm all for it. I think that's well, great. We'll ask waste management for a box. Mm -hmm. Specify that they're clean. <laughs> Great point. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other uh, agenda items? <coughs> going, back, going back for one second. In case anyone didn't know, beginning tonight after 1 o'clock in the morning, they're going to start spraying the mosquito stuff over us. So just stay indoors. <laughs> Midnight tonight. After 1 o'clock, they're going to start spraying. And this is going to be what they're going to start doing in the night. No, it's going to be low flying helicopters. Just aerial spray. Yeah, you know what the pesticide is? It's the it's a carcinogen. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> is it the one that's killing the bees? And it's the one that's yeah. doing yeah. a lot of damage in Miami right now, yes. Oh, no. And this is Brevard County Mosquito Control, and then, you know, it's state controlled decisions. So. So it's a state that made that? Well, it's a state law that requires mosquito control. So, um, and then also the state funding that came down to pad the pockets of all <laughs> people who own this mosquito control company. So. Even the governor's wife owns a company that has a huge influence on all the can't believe you can come up with something that's not like carcinogenic. It's all, mm -hmm. well, this will be on the agenda yeah. next week. Yeah, I was going to put, you know, you know like what the schedules. The fact is, they, it's like a money thing. I was just going to put together the background and the, you know, the laws that, are, that go along with it, um, who, who makes those decisions. Um, some of the groups, there's already a Facebook group that's um, put together. Stuff. Not the aerial spray, but the ground stuff, the trucks, stuff, the huge, huge like, mist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, can we get any data from any, are there any cities anywhere that are doing, that have mosquito, you know, that mosquitoes are at, well, I guess they're all over the country, that aren't spraying, and statistics on, like, you know, how many, is there any way to gather that information? Because well, it's not even, like, a, it's technically, like, a scare. It's not even, like, there's no, no, no statistics on, like, Zika. So, I mean. Right. No, I know. But, but there's other mosquito-borne diseases out there that we do have to be kind of concerned yeah. about. So malaria is we, no get, right. we don't want malaria. Yeah, we so don't. Like, I'm just curious if there's any other cities that have, have successfully not sprayed. Not in Florida. Do we know maybe in another state, you know, that we could get any information on what they've done to. Well, look at you. I don't know. 
I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm, I'm against no, breathing carcinogens, absolutely. But I'm just curious, like, if they have successfully done this, what have they done? Not, yeah. not a solution. Yeah. Well, I agree, absolutely. But I'm curious, like, what people have done in other areas if they've gone away from spraying pesticides and other than bad. I think most of the, um, the, the responses I've heard from people are, you know, that populations um, alternatively can take greater control over themselves, like wearing long sleeve shirts, you know, don't go going out in the dusk in the mornings, and, um, you know, trying as much to take more of a personal responsibility um, and, you know, not leaving areas of your yard, you know, right. with the containers that would breed them, things like that. Um, but I, in the state of Florida, I haven't heard of any areas that have not been sprayed. So, I, but I'll, I'll check into it though. I know. So, yeah. I mean, I, I can't talk about them getting bit by, I know, but you had malaria and all these really bad things. So, I mean, I, I hate pesticides, but I have a four-year-old, and if she were to catch any of these mosquito porn, you know, she would I understand, die. but looking at the statistics of how likely you are, there's far more other things you should be worried oh, about. Oh, yeah, sure. I, so. I know. I hear you. I hear you. Good. Any other uh, input for agenda items for next meeting? Okay, so we have uh, last uh, adoption of the minutes from the previous meeting. <coughs> so moved. Seconded. Mr. Fergus moved and Mr. Claus seconds. David Vigliotti? Yes. Mindy Gibson? Yes. David Floyd? Yes. Josh Todd? Yes. John Fergus? Yes. Josh Steen? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I should be prepared. I wish